joining us today. Um, this is, I believe, our fourth of five um, in our webinar series, uh, Market Analytics to Drive Decision Making. Our next webinar will be scheduled about a month from today, and I'll be sending out connection information again about a week before as a reminder. Um, we are recording this, and we are working to get the recordings available on our website. I sent out a link yesterday to our blog. We have two of the three previous ones already posted. So, as they become available and we get them posted, I'll be sure to keep everyone updated. Um, with that said, I will turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks, Laura. And today what I want to do is provide a brief overview of my colleague, John Downs. Um, so I've worked with John for about five years and has a comprehensive background really around leveraging different ways to use market data and different factors, both to drive service expansion, uh, but then also to look at things around capital expansion too. So just between the two of us, I've worked with him a number of times over the past some odd years to work on all types of projects from a capital replacement, hospital replacement, service expansion, uh, delivery expansion. So I felt it was great to actually afford him the opportunity to come and present to you, knowing that there are a large number of opportunities throughout Oklahoma. But with that, I will turn it over to John and he'll be uh, driving this for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Jonathan. Can folks, I guess we're probably all muted and everything. So I'm going to assume that folks can hear me uh, unless I hear Jonathan or Laura say that I've done something wrong. So I'll just proceed. Uh, certainly, if there are uh, questions or any of those types of things, I assume that Jonathan or Laura uh, will be looking at a chat box or something. Uh, but certainly, I'm available for questions uh, during, you know, if you want to go off mute and, you know, yell something out, uh, or after the presentation, uh, both during this time as well as uh, follow up beyond uh, beyond this session. But let's just jump right in and think about how we start using some market analytics to drive decision making. And so when I think about a market, when I think about how we figure out, you know, what is the likely amount of service that's offered in a particular community, there are really four key levers that we think about. One is the population. You know, how big is the geography? You know, what's that total market size? That gives us a sense as to, you know, from where might we bring volume to our facility that we would need to serve. The next piece, once we understand the actual population is the rate at which people in that population use various services. And that is dramatically different depending on where in the country you might be. Uh, I can go into some areas with booming, you know, 18 to 44 growth, and we're going to see a significantly higher childbirth rate there than in some rural communities where all of the growth is in the 65 plus age cohort unless there's a fantastic IVF program, we won't necessarily see uh, substantial amounts of childbirth in those areas. So we have the population, we then look at the rate at which that population utilizes services. That tells us for 100% of the market, how much stuff is being done, how many surgeries, how many ED visits, how many clinic visits. And then we have to understand from our perspectives as operators, owners of facilities, what is our share of that market going to be? What is it today? What might it be in the future? And if I was to change that share, if I was to do something relative to population, relative to the offering of services, or if someone did that to me, competition comes in and they start pulling some volume out, insurance companies start steering things away from the hospital side of service and into an ambulatory surgery side of service, thus driving my market share down. So that's an area that we certainly see a bit more up and down toggling. The one where we have the most control, though, is really looking at the throughput side. You know, how fast can we put someone through our facility? What are our hours of operation, days of the week? Um, you know, what is the shift that we'll see from longer surgical cases of the past to shorter cases of the future or vice versa. As we shifted towards more minimally invasive things, we saw surgical cases go up in terms of case length. What would that do to our throughput? And all of those four levers together model to begin looking at what types of facilities, how much space might we need to be able to accommodate that volume. So we think about market analytics, we're really asking the question of, what is today versus what might tomorrow look like? Because we're trying to get that view into the future. You know, any consultant, any executive that tells you they've got a crystal ball and they know exactly how many things you'll be doing in the future is either crazy or lying or both. 
um, you know, our job is to really just start getting a sense as to what that future might look like. We want to understand today who's active in the market. Where are we in the market and where are others in the market? What are our offerings? What are other offerings? And how far might a community have to go or be willing to go in order to, um, to achieve certain services? Sources of data really becomes the biggest piece in starting to look at market analytics. And there are lots of great places to get data, uh, starting with your own facilities. You know, hospital and patient level data is the absolute best, at least as it concerns the folks that you're providing care for today. But there's a tremendous amount of information inside of that data that can be mined out. Other sources of data, state data, you know, many states have uh, inpatient databases where we understand for all payers who's got what market share at down to a DRG level, down to a zip code level. That works really, really well. CMS, you know, we don't have it for all payer, but just for Medicare, uh, we can get access to that data also at similar levels of granularity. And then there are also the proprietary and subscription based data, whether that's SG2 or it's the advisory board or it's IBM Watson or a whole host of other folks that are out providing subscription-based data that often either takes into account state, CMS, perhaps some claims-based data aggregation uh, to be able to package that and then either sell that directly to the hospital or to a consulting firm to help out the hospital. The other key that we really want to think about when we're looking at analyzing a market is ask ourselves what's really important. Uh, I love data. I love digging down into the weeds and looking at a whole bunch of things. Uh, but what we have to really ask is what's important so we don't get this analysis paralysis. Because I can keep studying things 85 ways till Sunday, but if it doesn't make a difference in terms of what your behavior is going to be, are you going to invest in a new location? Are you going to need one of these things or two of those things or 10 of those things. Many times in smaller rural communities in particular, you can have 100% market share and still only need to have one MRI machine, one CT scanner. For us to drive down to the absolute number or is it important for us to be directionally correct? So it's really a question of asking, do you want to be wrong or precisely wrong? Because none of us are going to be precisely right. So let's jump in. We can start using market anal analysis to drive decisions in a whole bunch of areas. We might use it to say, where are the population centers? You know That we kind of know intuitively just by driving around, by living in our communities. But when we start looking at that on a map, oftentimes you say, oh, I didn't realize there was such a pocket of population in this area. Are we located in the right areas? Where are our services versus others? What's happening with various age cohorts and what does that mean for volumes? I mentioned earlier, you know, in a community with lots of growing 18 to 44 year olds, I'm going to have a more substantial OB volume or I have the potential for a more substantial OB volume than if I've got an area with declining 18 to 44 population and growing 65 plus population. Are there areas in our market that are growing faster than others? And it's really important when we're using the market analytics to distinguish between numeric growth, you know, the number of things that are growing versus the percentage, because oftentimes I might look at something and say, hey, it's growing by 700%, but that's only because it was going from two to eight. It wasn't, you know, going from, you know, 2,000 to 8,000. And so when we think about that, let's make sure we really look at what the percentage growth is versus the numeric growth. Uh, how do we fare within the competition? from where and to where are our patients traveling, particularly as we think about, you know, we may want to open a clinic in a new community. Right now, all the patients are that we have are coming to our main campus. And as we think about opening something in a new community, that might take some people from that community that are going elsewhere, and now they'll come to our facility located there. It also might be a good thing for some of our existing patients, instead of coming to the mothership, to go to that other community. And that's something that uh, market analytics helps us to be able to look at that. And finally, once we understand where we understand what, then we can start to understand, you know, how do we do that? How many sites, rooms, devices might we need in order to meet that need? So just thinking about some of the really high level ways to look at this, where do people live? Granted, this is, you know, in Connecticut, but Connecticut can go from, you know, being pretty urban and suburban 
to being really, really rural. And so we just looked at a population dot density map of Connecticut, and one dot is 250 folks. So we see lots of folks that get down towards New York City, towards Bridgeport, Stamford, New Haven, where Yale is, all of these places, and Hartford, lots and lots of population. But if you get out up into the northwestern corner of Connecticut, it's really, really wooded, really, really rural. Um, and certainly, as we think about offering services in those locations, is that something that would make sense? In order to do this, what do we need? We have to understand the data so we get the geography. I want all of Connecticut. I have an underlying map so I can understand where are these dots. And then population dot density, which we can pull from various sources like ESRI. We then might ask, how do our existing facilities align with those population centers? So in this particular example, we're working for a client that had facilities all throughout Connecticut. And we said, well, let's take that data, so those data that data exists as points on a map, we drop all of their facilities down on that map, overlay that population dot density on top of it, and we can start to see where are we offering services where there is population, where are we not offering services where there still is population. And then we can use mapping software to understand what's the distance, whether it's in distance or in drive time, from one of our locations. So I think this particular example is a 10 minute drive from any one of the Red Crosses on the screen. And so when I look at this, you know, we've got tremendous concentration that sits down in the center of the state, but there are a bunch of population locations. Now these may be served by other providers rather than the provider that we were working with, but if this provider was interested in going into other population centers, this quickly tells us, hey, there's some opportunity down here in zone one. There might be some opportunity in between zones three and four. There certainly appears to be some opportunity up north of New London in zone 14. Those are things that we can start asking, how do our facilities align with those population centers? And then we can expand those drive times out further and say, you know, if we're willing to go 30 minutes to each one of these uh, facilities, is there any place in the state that someone cannot get to our facility inside of 30 minutes. It's just another way to start slicing that data. We can then look at things and say, where is our competition? So <clears throat> in this particular example, uh, we were just looking for the competition of ambulatory surgery centers uh, and endoscopy centers that were floating around. And if they were not affiliated with us, they were listed with an X. So we've got a bunch of these Xs that are all scattered throughout. And if we were trying to locate something in those communities, we want to make sure that we're understanding where we are versus where they are, and does it make sense for us to try to compete for that market? Another thing that we look at when we're doing some of this analysis is drive time analysis. And this is really saying, hey, if I have a pool of patients, in this example, there were 23,000 patients that went to a particular clinic. And we said, okay, if I had to choose which one of the clinic locations. So I may have several options here on the left-hand side for existing sites. You know, we've got seven potential locations. We did an actual drive time from the patient address to that practice location, regardless of, you know, these are all 23,000 are from one practice, but we said stiff wind blows the practices down and we can only rebuild one. Where would be the best location for the majority of our folks. So this looks at it and says the average, if we're just thinking about it from an average perspective, scenario A is a 10.9 minute average drive time. Whereas if everybody instead had to go to, you know, this scenario on the far side, it's a 14.3 minute average drive time. This particular client was also looking at seven other locations and there was an opportunity to find one that for the average would be 9.8 minutes to drive to that particular location. In order to do this level of analysis, we need the existing addresses for the practices, for the patients, and for the potential addresses. And with that, the software can just be able to start looking at how those uh, different addresses might work for an overall strategy for the organization. Another one looks at it and says, you know, if we just said, well, we know that there's a small site and we want to understand if the stiff wind came and we were moving it to a different location. Uh, this is a, a practice where there were about 10,000 
uh, visits in general. Now, we may, in the previous example, get to something where we say we have a 9.8 or a 10.2 or a 14.3 minute uh, dr average drive time, but average means some are half or above and half or below. The more important way that I think it's to look at this is to say, if we re relocated the practice to this place, this place, or that place, for how many of our patients would it be better? And for how many of our patients would it be worse? And so in this scenario, we basically did a side-by-side -side comparison for each one of the patients and said in the Harley-Davidson uh, location that we were looking at, 76% uh, of the you know, plus or minus 10,000 patients would be better off. They would have a shorter drive time to go to that location rather than to the current location uh, for their site. Again, it needs the same type of data, but it's asking the question and answering it in a different way to really understand, great, I can make 76% of the people really happy, but now maybe I can filter on these 24% that are going to be dissatisfied by going to this location and figure out, is there something I can do? How dissatisfied really are they? I mean, if today it was you know, 41 minutes to get there and tomorrow it's 42 minutes, maybe that's not quite as big of a deal. But if it went from 10 minutes today to 25 minutes tomorrow, do I reach out to that patient and encourage them to go to a different practice? What can I do? But it starts to have us looking at that data underlying market analysis to help us make some of those decisions. Stepping back to kind of looking at an overall market, you know, we talked about it from a mapping and a population perspective. When we start thinking about from a utilization perspective, from a demand modeling perspective, it's really critical in my opinion that we develop non-overlapping service areas. This is an example for a client in very rural upstate New York. I think some of them would call it the capital district. That's a little bit near uh, Albany, kind of over on this side, centered around Cooperstown. And there are a bunch of hospitals out there, some affiliated with one system, others affiliated with another system. And as we were working for one of the systems, it was really important for us to look at a variety of different service areas so that within the same system, I'm not necessarily saying, I'm gonna get 60% of the orange section here. And my system partner in the blue over here thinks they're gonna get 60% of the orange section there. You know That doesn't make any sense. Let's make sure that we've got an idea that says we cannot have more than 100% market share inside of a given area, but let's not make let's make sure we're not double counting at all. So it's critical to develop those non-overlapping service areas. We can then drill down and say for our particular study, what would be that service area? So in this particular example, it got to a much smaller geography. And then once we understand that geography, we can start going back to those original four levers that I talked about, the population, the use rate, the market share, and the throughput as we determine what we might need. When we start looking at that overall geography, it gives us our first step to come up with a population base. Understand that you know, we've got a current population and a projected population. And I talked earlier about some of those changes in terms of the, uh, the average distribution between age cohorts. In this scenario, you know, we are looking at declining populations in everyone from zero to 64. All three of those categories are in the red. But as we think about the 65 plus cohort, 11.1% growth. So, you know, Medicare population growing substantially. We've got, you know, critical access hospital that's relying on cost-based reimbursement for that Medicare population. That could be good for them. Those 65 plus age cohort folks are going to utilize services at a different rate than younger folks. And they're going to utilize different services. The other piece is to understand inside of that geography, where are the main population centers? You know, this may be a large geography as often happens inside of rural communities, but once we get outside of the major population center, the individual population density drops down pretty substantially. So in this particular example, there were three areas that had, you know, relatively high population and the others were much smaller uh, overall. And as we look at some of those areas, understand what's happening in terms of number change, percentage change uh, for overall. In this scenario, every one of the markets was anticipating an overall decline in population over the next five years. Using those same population numbers, we want to understand 
what insurance categories has is growing for the population. So, you know, in this one, just looking at, you know, a couple of the bars, this light blue is private insurance going from 43% to 38.6% over the next 10 years. Uninsured down in yellow staying relatively consistent. Well, what's happening? We're seeing, you know, relatively robust expansion of Medicare. So those folks 65 plus aging into Medicare going from 17% to 21% and also relatively uh, reasonable growth in terms of the Medicaid population uh, in that particular market. So once we understand a bit about the population, then it's really looking at how services are being utilized inside of that market. So this is an example of outpatient estimates. And so, you know, Stroudwater uses IBM Watson Health uh, to draw this data. Others use other sources. Uh, but really the key is looking at how those services are broken out by individual service line, whether it's labs or medicine, physical therapy, x-ray, ED visits, ultrasound, general gastroenterology, understand what the current volume is. Remember, total population, total utilization rate. If I just divide those things, I can get a use rate per thousand people by calculating uh, this teal bar, basically, into my population number. The yellow bar gives me the change or the five-year projected number for all of these service lines. We then look into the future. And so the difference between the teal bar and the yellow bar in terms of percentage gives us our five-year percentage growth for each one of those services. So picking a couple on here, we may look at something like ED visits in this particular market projected to grow by 6.2% over the next five years. We may look at CT scans projected to grow by 29.5% over the next five years. There's something happening relative to standard of care, more folks inside the emergency department getting CT scans. Perhaps that's the issue. Perhaps that's something that we want to drill down into with the client to make sure we're understanding, is that a real number? Have we seen that year over year over year? If I look at that and annualize the 30% over five years, you know, I'm looking at a 6% growth per year, you know, five and change. Has the hospital seen a 5% growth in market utilization for CT scans, making sure that the data is good. The other piece to make sure we understand when we start looking at those outpatient opportunities is where are the things being done today? So again, this breakdown of site of service, ambulatory surgery center, ED, hospital outpatient, independent lab, other outpatient physician office, or urgent care, those are for all 852,196 things up here. As we drill down into individual service lines, these bars will change substantially. If I looked at ED visits, the vast, vast, vast majority of that is going to occur in the emergency room. You know, if I look at ED visits in here, we're seeing 12,900, 12,800 ED visits uh, in current year. Yet on this side, we're seeing 53,930 things done in the ED. Well, that's because there are a bunch of things that get done as a result of being in the emergency department. If I do a laceration repair, if I do an x-ray, if I draw labs, if I do all of those things, but inside the emergency site of service, that would show up in this location. We can also drill down to the individual procedure. And this is, you know, Jonathan mentioned before, you know, thinking of offering new services. In this particular market, again, that same 31,000 person market in kind of Capital District, New York, their current estimate for outpatient GI procedures, colonoscopy, upper GI, endoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, so on and so forth, is about 3796, projected to decline slightly over the next five years by 1.3%. So just a decline of 50 uh, overall. How are those distributed in current day about 212 of those are done in ambulatory surgery centers, 28 in the ED. Most are done in hospital outpatient settings, some done in physician offices. And this will definitely change market to market based on the prevalence of ambulatory surgery centers. Different regulations relative to what can be done in a physician office versus in the hospital setting. Uh, the type of providers in the community and the comfort that they may have doing things in various settings. Uh, so it's important to really look at that site of service, at least understanding what's happening today, 
And then when we project to the future, start to ask ourselves, do we believe those sites of services are going to change? As we see uh, continued pressure on reimbursement, are we going to see things leave the hospital outpatient environment and go to physician office or other locations uh, for diagnostic imaging, as an example? The other piece that we want to be able to look at, and this can go into smaller geographies as well, but going back to our example from uh, our folks in Connecticut, understanding where the volume's growing by region. So when we looked at, you know, in terms of the number of incremental things for medicine office visits, uh, you know, this zone two was really seeing a substantial growth, uh, 257,000 additional uh, office visits that would be in that region alone. That's a really substantial number. If we were saying these are just five-year changes, if we were to put new services into there, you know, we don't have to steal share from someone else. We can attract some of that 257,000 visits. Again, it can get you know down to a smaller number when we start looking at smaller communities. The other piece begins, how do we start refining that into individual zip codes? Same set of data, but where in terms of this market are the areas that we're anticipating to see the most substantial growth? Now, in some of these areas, some of these you know lighter beige areas, remember we talked about that upper left-hand corner of Connecticut being really rural, not a lot of growth up in that market. Again, down into this area, there were no, in that zone two that we showed on the previous slide, and I'll slip back and forth, you know, this was by far our highest area in general in terms of aggregate for the region. But when I start to look at individual zip codes, something up here might make more sense for us to be locating our next offering. Uh, looking at it from a procedural level, instead of looking at it in terms of uh, the actual office visits, where might GI procedures, those same GI procedures we talked about earlier, be growing? And in other areas, there's projected decline, you know, minus 24, minus 21 over the next five years, but a pickup of 400 additional GI procedures and 151 additional GI procedures uh, just north of it. You know, suddenly we're looking, hey, we've got 550 projected new GI procedures in that market you know, without necessarily trying to take share from anybody else. Is there an opportunity for us to expand? Is it an opportunity for offering a new service? And I mentioned earlier the importance of looking at things both in terms of number and percentage growth because they can mean uh, two very, very different things. You know, when I look at uh, the chart on the, or the map on the right, a five-year percentage change in outpatient uh, volume, we see 7.1% overall up in zone three. But if I just think of it from a color perspective, you know that 7.1% here turns to 25,439 because the volume itself was a little bit higher up there. When I look at, or a little bit lower up there, when I look down at zone two though, 46,910 incremental uh, procedures or visits in that market translated only to a 6.6%. So it's important to understand both where we're locating uh, and what that overall or underlying population and therefore demand might be. The other way that we can start looking at some market analytics to make decisions is in terms of what our share of the volume is. So looking at inpatient share, I mentioned, you know, some states have relatively good uh, state data that we're able to access or hospital associations are able, able to access to give us a sense at a, an individual service line of an individual DRG, at a various level of acuity, what our share of particular services might be, and even down to individual zip codes. So if we were to say, well, we don't have any presence in this particular market uh, because we don't have a clinic there, well, let's understand what the underlying inpatient utilization, outpatient utilization might be. And if we were to put a clinic into a particular location, would that send volume downstream uh, to the hospital itself? So, you know, looking at what our share, you know, this particular client was the orange, uh, you know, what was our share of a various service line? And then what was the mothership, their tertiary partner for the system? What was their share? And combined, do we own most of the market? It's okay oftentimes for a rural hospital that's affiliated with a larger tertiary provider to not do everything themselves. And the system is happy because they'll just keep it in the, in the family, if you will. But in this particular market, we look at a lot of these other kind of lighter gray areas 
And those are not staying inside the system. They're going to somebody else in the market, at least inside of the state. And that becomes more challenging. You know, how are we going to deal with a population health strategy if folks that, you know, are living in our communities are going to other places uh, for their care? And is there a strategy for us to use this data to begin making some decisions? Outpatient market share is usually much, much more challenging. Um, there are very few states that we work with that can give us uh, really robust outpatient market data. Uh, some states far better than others. Uh, and I guess this goes back to one of the first things that I said is, you know, in rural communities in particular, in places that have smaller volumes, what we often have to ask ourselves is, does it really matter? If I had 5% market share, if I had 25% market share, if I had 95% market share, do I need any more than the number of devices that I have now? Now, the work that Jonathan does on the financial modeling side of it, absolutely, it can matter a lot more to get to that level of precision. But in terms of, do I want to be in the game? Don't I want to be in the game? What level of facility might I require? Those things oftentimes won't necessarily need uh, to get down to that level of detail. So the ideal approach is that there would be a state all-payer database for inpatient and outpatient services. And we would be able to say, for these zip codes, here's the volume you did, and you have this share of that market. You know, Many states don't have that, and those that do often don't have it down to you know, a very fine level of detail. Some have, you know, ambulatory surgery, but who really knows what's included inside the ambulatory surgery name. Uh, some will have x-ray and or have CT and MR, but not x-ray. Uh, some will have just emergency, and then they'll have their inpatient things. Uh, the other approach that you can do is to basically look at your actual patient origin. So dig into your raw data and understand that 37% of your ED volume comes from this zip code, 22% comes from that one, so on and so forth, until we build up to our 75% you know, market. And then that gives us our service area and we confirm that we did in fact uh, pull the population for the proper service area earlier on. The other way that we can do that, and this overstates market share a little bit, is to basically say, IBM Watson gives us the primary service area estimate. So for ED visits, X-ray, CT, MR, ultrasound, so on and so forth, gastro, outpatient surgery, in a given community or a given geography, IBM Watson will give us that they expect to see 6,769 ED visits. That's expected to grow by 3.2% 3, 3 over the next five years or an annual growth of 0.6%. And GI services, 2,078 in current year projected to grow by 3.5% over the next five years. And so that's a 0.7%. We can then compare our volume to those numbers and just calculate the share there. Now, what this doesn't do, because this is kind of the third bullet, this is skipping over you know, the approach of doing a patient origin study, but basically saying, we're going to assume that every one of our patients comes from inside of our primary service area. And so, you know, if the primary service area estimate is that there would be 6,769 ED visits, and we actually saw 10,219, the calculated market share is 151%. Okay, can't have more than 100% market share. So it means one of those two numbers is incorrect. Remember, the first column is a series of estimates. So while IBM Watson, previously Truven, does use claims aggregation and a bunch of analysis to make their projections, they don't always get everything exactly right. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so in a community that might have challenges with access to primary care, uh, the inability to get appointments, all of those kinds of things that may utilize the emergency room at a higher rate than expected, then we can start to see higher volumes in the ED than what would originally be estimated in the market. The other piece would be anyone in migration, you know, coming from service areas outside of the primary service area that are utilizing your service. If I'm in Oklahoma, I go to one of your hospitals, you know, I show up as a click in the green column. You know, I had an ED, ED visit, and I had an X-ray, so I, I'm one of these and one of these, but I'm not in this primary service area estimate because my estimate is in Framingham, Massachusetts. And so we start to see some overstating of that primary service area, but what or of that the market share from the primary service area. 
where I think we can still go forward in decision making is as long as we understand kind of the rules of the game that we're setting up here. We've got an estimate. We've got our share. Yes, it's going to come up high because we're assuming everybody comes from here. But going forward, I can still say I'd like to pick up 10% more market share. Now, in the example of the ED, because we're so high, I would actually want to go to another level of detail with them to look at that patient origin piece and understand, are we really getting people from far afield that aren't in our primary service area? Has this been consistent over time? Do we have access to primary care? All of these other kinds of things. But the rest of these services, I think that there's a reasonable opportunity for us to attract additional market share, whether those folks live in our primary service area or they don't. I can still say, why are we only at 56.8% of the expected MRI volume if folks have the access to get that here in our location? Same thing with GI, same thing with surgical procedures. The other piece that I was talking about earlier is really asking the question of, does it even matter? So if I think about you know, an overall market, one way that we can do that is to say, you know, in a given community, if in 2030, so remember, we've, if I go back to that previous version, we had 6,769 ED visits in current year. They were projected to increase over the next five years. We basically extrapolated that out to 2029, so 10 years out, did this a year ago, or two years now, and it was 7,215 is the estimate for ED visits. If I look at a certain number of visits per room per year based on how they use throughput at that facility, it would tell me that, excuse me, I need six ED treatment spaces if I got 100% market share. You know, if I had 50% market share, I need three ED treatment spaces. So ED, there's going to be a little bit more of you know, a wild swing, particularly because we're doing more than 100% market share. We talked about that already. And that would say that I needed nine rooms. But let's look at excuse me, let's look at GI. GI services today, my market share, if I extrapolate just the volume out into the future, I'd need, I'd have about a thousand GI procedures and I would need one GI room to accommodate that. If I look at getting 100% market share, I'm at 2,200 GI procedures. Yeah, I just cross over needing a second room uh, in terms of, you know, if I look at, you know, 2,000 visits per room per year, I need 1.09, so I don't want to be the guy with the 0.09 room. So that one rolls up to two. But the chances of me getting to 100% market share, probably between slim and none. So at 75% market share, I need one room for all of those things. Suddenly, it doesn't make a tremendous difference in terms of what those needs might be. When I look at diagnostic imaging, the same type of thing. MRI, whether I have 75% market share, I have... 25% market share, my current market share, I still need one MRI. Ultrasound, I can go from having 100% share and need three or down to needing two in any of the other scenarios. My current market share, and this is where throughput becomes something that we start looking at. In the current share for ultrasound, I may come across and say, I have 3,290, I can do 3,200 ultrasounds per room per year based on their throughput assumptions, that tells me I need 1.01 and it rounds up to two. Well, if I stayed open another hour a day, I can easily accommodate that extra amount of volume that would come in. It would drop it below 1.01, but it also tells me I've got to start thinking because I'm getting close to that number. I've got to start thinking about where might my second room go. So just to kind of wrap up, you know, the didactic portion of of the presentation, certainly take questions as as needed or available. Um, You know, it's understanding the key drivers of healthcare demand is the first piece, you know, understand those four four levers, because that's what's going to start to enable us to use any tool that provides the underlying market data for those four levers in order to drive some of our decisions. Understand that your states, your systems, your hospitals, your practices, have tremendous amounts of data already. Even if you can't get everyone's data, just by having your own data, there is tremendous power in there. The key is being able to access it, manipulate it, and then develop it into information. You know, just having massive spreadsheets of stuff, you know, pivot tables upon pivot tables upon pivot tables, 
alone doesn't turn it into information. You've really got to work to get to that and have that in an information setting where people can make decisions off of it and try to make it as kind of distributed throughout the organization as possible so that providers are understanding what a lot of this data is. Um, you know, the administrators may understand it far better than the providers do. But, you know, when an admin administrator says, well, why aren't you doing X? And the provider says, well, I don't even know what's in the market. There's a disconnect there. So let's make sure that we bring everyone together in understanding the data that exists. Focus on what's matter. You know, that analysis paralysis, let's stay away from that wrong or precisely wrong, you're not going to be exactly right. So let's not strive for that, but let's strive for being directionally correct so that we can get to a go, no go decision. You know, that's really the the key in, you know, trying to understand how we're using this underlying data to make decisions. We're not looking at it just to have data for data's sake. We're looking at it because presumably it's going to make us more intelligent for deciding to do something going forward. And if we can get that information out to a large number of people within our senior teams and our provider groups, and even I would say, you know, out to members of the community, I do a ton of master facility planning with small rural communities. And oftentimes, you know, when we're doing a kickoff meeting or when we're doing our exit presentation, the board is involved in both of those. And, you know, board members in rural communities may have expertise in healthcare, they board members in you know in urban communities may have expertise in healthcare or may not. They're board members because they're bringing other perspectives to the table. They're respected members of the community, sometimes perhaps donors. Um, but all of those things, you know, if we can get the board and members of the community understanding the underlying drivers and the underlying data, then it's a lot easier when we get to a point of having to make a decision about we're not going to offer XYZ service. You know, you remember we had that conversation and we looked at OB volume and OB market, OB volume in the market. If we had 100% share, there were only 187 deliveries. And, you know, here's the local providers that are doing that, you know, that are a little bit outside of our primary service area, but we're going to provide, you know, on campus prenatal care and we're going to provide on campus follow up. And we're going to do a bunch of other things. We're not going to deliver babies. It's always a difficult conversation to have in communities, but it's something that does get. Uh, that does get better if we understand the data as opposed to just you made that decision because it loses money or you made that decision because you don't want to deliver babies. Whatever it is, making sure that more people understand the data helps us out in the future. With that, I will take questions. It's, it's odd not seeing all of you. So, um, but uh, if there are questions that I can that I can answer, I'm happy to take them. If this is the right time, if there's another time, um, I'm happy. My contact information is on the screen, uh, and happy to field them then. Mm -hmm.